copyrights in the musical and literary work, the copyrights in the sound recording. Okay, so Wade and Gareth are are specifically represent the, the 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 way that the sound recording gets monetized. So you have come out of your you have come out of your out of your studio session, or you've come out of the mixing, the mastering process, and you have the banger. Okay, the banger is sitting as an MP3 or a WAV file. Okay, that is the sound recording. And because you have now gone through this process of making sure that all the rights holders are taken care of and everything like that, let's say that you own the sound recording and you've got a 20% deal with a featured artist or somebody who, who came to feature on your beat and you offered them 20% or 30% or maybe it's a 50-50 deal between you and somebody else, but you are the person that, that now owns the sound recording, you are looking to make sure to get the most money back from that sound recording, right? You want to get the, you want to get rands in, well, dollars in your pocket, okay? And one of the people that can get you the most dollars in your pocket is in grooves. Am I right? Great. 100%. Take it away. All right. So um, I speak to people about distribution every day. I, I try and find labels that we can distribute to, for, artists we can distribute for. And the, the main part of my job is is finding the right artists that I think we should be working with, etc., and then working alongside with our team. So when I was asked to come today, I I, I asked if, if Wade would join me um, to give you guys a much uh, better understanding of exactly how, like I like to always say, the pup and place works behind it. You know, is um, I can tell you what you can t what what we have to offer, and he can explain exactly how he does it. But the thing I've realized when I talk about distribution, and it, it, it's scary that it's not just young, up-and-coming musicians, is we meet with major label, no, not major labels, but label owners, um, already very established artists, and it always blows my mind how little many musicians understand distribution and, and how they, and how they're not understanding how to get the most art out of their distributor, or understanding exactly what it is their distributor can offer them, you know. Um, if you look at the DIY um, distribution sites, it's about knowing how much are you getting paid per stream. Everyone wants to get paid, we've been discussing this, is understanding that if they tell you you're getting 100%, are you getting 100%? Is that distributor going directly to each store, to Apple, to Spotify, to Boomplay, Deezer, or are they going through a pipe? And um, so for us, for instance, it, it, many of you would probably know us more as Electro Mode and now in Grooves. In Grooves bought, in Grooves bought Electro Mode. In Grooves is owned by Universal Music, which means that we go direct to every single store. That means there's no pipe between us and the store so you get the maximum payout you can get. And there, there's a limited amount of distributors that offer that, which we are one of them. It's important for you guys to know that. You know, delving into, into the, the meat and bones of, of what you are getting. What a DIY setup, for instance, is I'm starting out in a band or starting writing songs. I'm recording songs in my, in my bedroom. Um, I don't have a track record. There's no official distributor that might be interested in me. I've got nothing to show them as of yet. It's a great way to get your music out there. It's available to everyone and, and works. Get, yeah, gets your name out there, gets you there, gets you to the point to make a deal with the distributor, with a record label going forward. You know, our, our thing is that we are not just a distributor. We, we, we distribute music, we get it online. A lot of people still think distribution and labels is distribution. We just put the music online. We do much more than that, is that we pitch for playlists. We pitch for banners, for editorials. That's for all releases we do. We also have label services, which Wade will delve, delve into a little bit more. And stop me at any time if there's something you want to jump in and say. Yeah. Is, is for us, it's, it's about what more can we offer you, you know, other than just getting your music out and pitching for playlists. So it, it has got to a point where distribution is no longer just getting your music 
up online on all the platforms, but servicing that music and us opening the doors for curators to hear it. With the label services, it means that the, the means to plug your music to radio. We use a system called Play MPE, which means that we deliver, it's a delivery service we use to get music out to all radio stations. It is, um, it's a, it's a one-off cost, and it goes to radio stations, and you can, you, you get a login where you can actually see, has somebody opened your music? Has somebody listened? Have they actually played it on the station? You more interactive, you can see what's going on. Different to Radio Monitor, but um, yeah, I don't know if you want to jump in a little bit on some of the other services from the marketing, the digital, the YouTube, which is obviously your primary role. Sure. Um, just off the back of uh, what James was talking about, um, if you go to our website and you go to the distribution tab and you scroll down, there's a section there for artist and label resources. This is open to anyone, and you can download your split sheets right there and then and start using them. Okay. Cool. We like to support artists in any way we can. Um, so, yeah. So let's say you get signed to InGrooves, and you come through, then you'll eventually get introduced to me. As you know, all platforms these days have gone video. Right? So this is like the most super important part of it, hey? Wait, before you carry on, you just said, you just said before you get signed to InGrooves, and I just want to be clear, what, what he's talking about is not signing, in the, in signing as a label. So you're not signing your masters to InGrooves, you're signing, you're signing on to InGrooves in this, in, this, in, this, in this instance. He's saying you're signing a deal in which you will distribute, I would, um, maybe, maybe, this is, maybe we'll unpack this a little bit later, I'm gonna let you carry on. But you're not signing your masters. Okay, so this is not a this is not a mastership owning. So you're not signing a deal like you're signing with a record label. This is a distribution deal where you own your masters and you're signing a specific um, right to them to take your masters and to, and distribute them around where they take a percentage or there is some sort of there is a financial agreement between you and them of some sort, but you retain the copyright. Okay. Yeah, you still own 100% of your music. And when your deal is up with us, you and your music and whatever content you've distributed with us stays with you. Um, sure. So you then get introduced to me, and I'll talk to you about what your marketing strategy is like. What are you looking to achieve, um, you know, and how can we support you in your way? You are still the driver of, of your label. You still have your own direction, your own creative direction, and we'll say, how do we support you? You, the driver, will be your engine, pretty much. You say turn left, you say accelerate, we'll help. So, as I was saying, YouTube video, massive. As you know, Facebook, Instagram, also high priority on video content, short form, currently. Um, but I always try and get my artists to focus a bit more on YouTube and longer form content because long form content can always form your short form content. So if you have, for example, uh, a video based release strategy, you will have a visualizer, a lyric video, an official video, a live video, all of that. Maybe even a remix, which you put into video content. You take your visualizer, you then sample a piece of it, and you could put it onto your, all your short form content, pushing people back up to YouTube. You then, a week later, release your uh, lyric video. You chop out a piece of the hook, you put it on as short form content around your other uh, platforms. Telling people, go back, check the full video on YouTube. Remember, YouTube pays, eh? Then, you put out your official video. Great, you put out your official video, chop out a piece, put it on small, all on short form. And that's like the sort of sales funnel in marketing. We call it a sales funnel. Um, so now, once you have all that out, you could even gamify it and say, okay, guys, if I reach, uh, whatever, 20,000 views or 10,000 subscribers on my YouTube channel, I'll do a live performance for you guys, you know, 
And then that's your fourth piece of content that you're putting out. You know? Um, and this form, of, this is a, a decent little strategy for people to use because it kind of applies to everything. But um, every, every piece of content and every, every release strategy is different in reality. You could focus more on stills. You could focus more on new skins, you know, on your, on your social media. As you guys know, Spotify for artists, Apple for artists. You can upload um, motion art. You know, that's something else to talk about. And a marketing strategy comes down to that. How much content do you have to share and to talk about? And once you start collaborating with other people, because as you said, this industry, you can't, you gotta be a very special person if you can do every single role, you know? So we collaborate with different people and those other people also talk about what's going on. You tag them, they tag you, your reach goes out. Then apart from putting together that content strategy, then you start looking at mainstream media as well, getting your, your song to radio, getting your official music video on TV, getting your video to stores like Amazon and Apple who actually host music videos, you know? Um, and once that goes out as well, there's more talkability to, you to, to talk about. Um, and these days, uh, you know, everything is, is, is rushed. Artists love to rush a release. They'll make it on a Wednesday, they'll master it on Thursday, and they want it out by Friday. <laughs> but it doesn't help anyone. It really doesn't help anyone. Um, if you ever pitched for yourself in Spotify, you'll know that once you've pitched a single, you can't pitch for another release until that one's out. The curator team that's curating playlists also need time to listen to these tens of thousands of releases every week and decide which songs are going into which playlists. So you've got to give them the time as well. So we like to ask our, our clients, you know, give us six to four weeks from upload and ingestion. So once you've uploaded it into the system, six to four weeks before the release day so that you can then go and pitch to all these different services. Giving them enough time to look at what you're pitching, read your press release, you know, look at your bio, look at your, your social media following and decide whether they want to actually place you and where they want to place you. Um, all good, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I think fr from my point is, you know, as a, as a young artist now trying to sign with in grooves, is, is you, you might wonder what is the next step that's going. And one of the first things I learned when I was learning, working in music distribution is that the song is still everything. We can't give you a number one hit. A good distributor, if you give them the time to work your release, can open those doors for your song to be heard by the right people. No amount of, of marketing can make a song a hit. If the people don't want it, that you can't shove it down their throat. We've learned that now, you know? And it's just about the fact that you should know that your relationship with your distributor should be one that can grow so that you have a family-like relationship with your distributor. We've had many artists come through our stable that have started on, we've got different deals, we've got 80-20 deals where it's just straight distribution and we get your songs on the platforms, we pitch for playlists. We, do, we, we don't plug to radio, we don't pay for music videos, we don't do that sort of thing, but the deals are fluid, which means that as your numbers increase, as while we work together as your social media numbers, your streaming numbers, if there is potential to know that you can have the relationship with your account manager and go, listen, my last single did 20,000 streams in six months. I've been listening to what Wade has been telling me. I've been doing the shorts. I've been pushing on TikTok. I'm up to 80,000 streams on this last release and it's been three weeks. And we will look at it. We also look at follow our acts that we have and go, there is potential, yeah, this act might have hit a ceiling now where a video could be the thing that could push him through. Which means that 
we're now at a place where we can renegotiate your deal. And it's really important that you know that you have that relationship with your, with your account manager and with your distributor. And um, it kind of was the wrong time to bring this up. And it, I just should have brought this in before. But, you know, it's like from my side, as, as an artist signing, the, the song and the music is the most important thing. If you want to ask, what is it we're looking for, you know? Um, I know it's horrible when you send through a song and I ask for links to your social media handles. I know for a new artist that's like the most intimidating thing because you're like, damn it, man. I've got like 900 followers. Remember that like Mapurisa had 900 followers at some point in his life. It's not the sole thing I'm looking for when I review an artist. First of all, the music, is there potential there? Then looking at the socials is how do you communicate with your audience? You know, what is your rapport like with your audience is because you can have banger songs. You know, we, I've, I've had a couple submissions now of late, not too many, but they still come in where you get a song and the artist hasn't even got social media pages. So I'm like, how do we push this? <laughs> In the end of the day, how do we get, get this out there, you know? So it's about, like, if you're going to try and get a deal with a distributor, is making your brand as attractive as possible. Is, and, and then we will help you make it more attractive. But that's how you get the attention, is make sure you've got a good song. Make sure you've got everything looking as hot as you can get it to look, you know? Um, it's because we sign many, many acts that have a thousand followers on Instagram. They're just getting out there. And you know that 600 of those got people or family or went to high school with them or go to church with them or whatever the situation is. But it's how you, how you sell yourself. So I know I get asked, that's one of the main questions I get asked from young guys because, you know, when you're trying to sign over a black diamond or somebody like that, it, it's not even something we, we're asking for because it's such public knowledge with you guys we're buying into so much more or partnering with so much more than just the songs and knowing that there's a look and a feel and the way you communicate and we're going to be working together with us so we want to sell that music as best as possible you guys must have a lot of questions i'm sure there must be questions here okay um i just want to say from my side this is a uh um, I will, I'm going to be asking questions because I'm working with an act that I would like to explore, like uh, this kind of thing. That I, what, I'm, what I've heard, what I've heard here, has been like really exciting for me as well. Um, you know, uh, from from that thing. So uh, let's. Sorry, let's if, I might, you... if I might add just one more thing, um, just to kind of close off the circle. Once, you know, I think another very important thing from a distributor is correct reporting. You know, um, we, we have an app called Trends Now. You can actually download it from an app store that all our artists can literally log on on their mobile device and see where, they, where their songs are playing, how many streams they've got, all of that, you know. And there's an entire finance department that they can contact and talk to. How do I read my reports, you know? How do I, how do I find this particular service? And analytics, because analytics, your social media analytics, your sales, all of that will determine how you should market and focus your music in order for it to grow. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to touch on yeah. that. I thought awesome. the reporting is so key. And so I was saying I've got two questions. Um, first one is more along the lines of releasing your music on Spotify and Apple Music. When we look at social media, um, you have a lot of techniques that are ideal to get you, I don't know, exposure, growth, views, likes, and things like that. So first question would be around releasing your music or dropping your music onto those platforms. Would you suggest something along the lines of uh, doing it on a regular basis if you've got the, the music, or is it okay to do it like sporadically? Um, and then second question would be specifically on the platforms of NFTs with music. When it comes to a release strategy, um, regular releases 
regular consistent releases I feel are definitely uh, a stronger way of releasing music. Um, although it also comes down to are you releasing singles, are you releasing a full body of work, you know, because um, that would make a difference. I read a very interesting uh, uh, blog post the other day about whether it's better to do a surprise release or whether it's better to do a strategy release where you'd build up to the actual release coming out. And the con or they actually compared bigger artists because they got the market there. It was between Drake and um, uh, Taylor Swift. And at the end of it, Drake's planned release was a lot better, but Taylor Swift's surprise release was better. And I think it comes down to your market. You know, how engaged are your fans on your pages? How easily can you reach them? Do you have an email list that, with direct access or a WhatsApp group, you know? Because that is really valuable um, uh, leverage to have just to instantly access somebody. Um, so I think a more regular release strategy might keep people engaged, you know? Yeah. I'm going to add to that. I, I think somebody might have, uh, you, I, I think I've told the story before, but um, uh, I was having this conversation with um, with Maporisa and um, in the conversation I, I asked him, like, he, he needed something from me. And so I said to him, well, I'll tell you, but first you told me how to be like a successful producer, you know? And um, the his response i think was probably one of the like most life changing like things because of how simple it was and he literally just said to me produce every day and release as often as you can you know and to tie into your thing so the one you know the um what wade was saying there the one value of releasing often is obviously because you're getting regular uh, because of uh, just um having having that regularity and building your building your building a uh, sort of a regular fan base there's something else that's very, very important, and and something that that, uh, that that I think, especially as a creator, is something that we all shy away from because of our. Uh, um, it's very scary to put yourself out there, you know. The thing about putting yourself out there regularly is that you, if you want to know what the best version of yourself as a creator is, you have to. You can only do that with the feedback, with a feedback loop that you create with you and your fan base. You can't decide what the best version of yourself is. You can't, your parents can't decide, your friends can't decide. The only people that can guide you to be the best version of who you are as a creator is fans that give you feedback. You have to get the shit. You have to, you have to know what's cuck. You have to know what's not working. You have to know what, what isn't working so that you can give your fans what is working. Okay, and the the most like the the incredible examples is that if you think of any of your favorite acts, okay, think of Casper and Mafikizolo, and think of Mapi, Mapurisa, and think of Drake, and think of things like how many actual songs? Like if I just say to you, what is the maximum? How many Drake songs can you name right now? Okay. What percentage of all of the Drake songs that have ever been released in history, how many of, what is the percentage you're going to get, okay, as the biggest Drake fan, if you think you're the biggest Drake fan, you know, if you think of Mafiki Zolo, think of, of like Six Mabone and all those, all those, all those albums from the 90s, okay, those albums from the 90s and from 2000s is what led to Ngeke Balunge and what led to these like Tandorwetu and all those, all those things. They wouldn't have had those tracks. They wouldn't have had the bangers, the Ndihamba Nawes and the, what, and the Udakwa and Jalos and stuff. They wouldn't have had those tracks had it not been for all the crap that was sitting on the B-sides and all the extra album tracks that they released because there's so much feedback that, they were, that they're getting the whole time. You know, they've performed all those other songs so many times to know that, you know, like, you know, to get to the corners, you know. Like all of those tracks, they, they would never have gotten there had they not had the feedback from the audience the whole time. They're giving, allowing the audience to tell them what they like and what they don't like. And so that's, a, that's you know, for me, is a very, very important part of the, just the practice of being a creator is to actually get out of your, the internal thing of like, I'm going to release it when it's perfect, you know. And you sit there and three years later and four years later and five years later, it's like, 
you know, what, you still got nothing. Nothing's out there. Still haven't heard you think, yo, but I'm a good singer, man. You must hear me. You know, like you're gonna, I'm gonna go knock on the door of the label, guys. I got, I am the best thing, you know. And they're gonna, and they're gonna, you know. Your hard drive is full of songs. <laughs> That's it. Anyway, so I just wanted to just, just to, just to, just to get onto, onto that thing to, to, to support what they're saying is, is that, you know, the, especially as a, uh, you know, at the, at the beginning, I was, I was, like, I would say release, release often as much as you can. And then I'm glad you asked about NFTs, actually. Because when that started to come out, and I think it's just still too new for us to actually really gauge how important it's going to be. Um, but do you think Buster 99 fans are going to go buy NFTs? No. You know, it's, I think it's those sort of, like, that sort of sales are for your, I don't know, Beatles and stuff that is super nostalgic. Or, you know, that sort of stuff. I don't see our everyday releasing now sort of hits going that way, especially in the South African market or the African market in general, um, unless there is that, that nostalgia feeling to it where you want to actually own this piece of something, you know. There's also, we're very much with the niche artists, you know. I know a lot of artists who will never get the streaming numbers, the kind of music they pop, play, you know, guys doing dream pop on a, you know, like anything artsy, left field, but their fans want them to carry on creating. And it's about their fans knowing there's not hundreds of thousands of people streaming this music. So NFT makes it possible for their favorite band to carry on creating, which I, I, think, I think that's for me where I see NFTs right now is it's the fans committing to being a fan of this band and going, your art is so valuable to me, I'm willing to put so much more in than just stream because streaming might not keep that niche sound alive, you know. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tula Ranyo, and my, my question is, uh, as a distributor, from which organization do you guys uh, get your, your profits? Because we have some growth for, for writers and... And, and we have Kapasu, so um, I'm wondering, are you guys uh, going to get your profits from Kapasu or, or, or from the sales? Um, these guys do not earn from Kapasu because Kapasu doesn't pay, doesn't, doesn't work for, doesn't service, service them. So Kapasu is set up, um, they are legally set up to represent songwriters and publishers. Okay, so people who are involved in the musical and literary work, those people... Capasso is legally set up to, to make sure that those people get paid royalties anytime money changes hands in this world. So these guys don't actually earn from Capasso. In fact, they actually have to pay Capasso, am I right? Yeah. So in fact, uh, what, the, what, the law prov what the law says, okay, is that I can, I can release, you, if you have written a song, okay, I can do a sound recording and I can go and release that song provided I pay you a royalty, okay? And that royalty number is actually set, okay? The trouble is it's impractical for me as the sound recording person to go and find every single composer and do like one-on-one -on -one royalty splits with each person, okay? So the law then says what they set up is the facility where there can be an organization that manages the flow of money from the sales of the sound recording, of which a percentage by law has to go to the person who composed it. So, the, so when I was talking about the sound recording, the record label has, is, is allowed by law to, to release a sound recording with this person's copyright, okay? And the law actually says, as long as they, so I can, they, if, if, if this is a cover of the musical work, the law says you can do it provided that this musical work has been made public somehow, okay? Otherwise, you have to get the actual person's, the songwriter's approval, okay? So, so in the case where it's the first release of a song, then you automatically have the songwriter's approval because the, in most cases the songwriter is, was either worked on, the, on that track or is one of the artists who, who released it. But like if I wanted to do a cover of Jerusalem, the law says I can do it with, I don't have to go to the songwriters and get their permission. But what I do have to do by law is I have to pay a percentage to the, compo to the publisher, to the person who owns the, 
the, the, the composition, okay? And the law has now set up Capasso to do that, to do that. Okay, so I, if, 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 if I go and release and iTunes pays me 10 Rand, okay, a portion of that is gonna go to Capasso, and that's what, and that's what, what Ingrooves would do or any other, any other distributor. So DistroKid or TuneCore, whoever, has to pay Capasso. So if, if I'm, I know as a service, because I used to work for a streaming service before Ingrooves, um, the actual service reported back to Capasso, not the distributor. So, oh, so iTunes is actually paying Capasso, not Ingrid. So these are the, all the streams, and we report back to them, and gotcha. the, the service has the agreement with the yes. rights collection on what percentage they're paying to for each stream. So it's actually even a step above Ingrooves. Does that make sense? So iTunes has received, let's say, two rand in total for your song. They first are going to pay Capasso and report to Capasso. Okay, and after that, let's say there's one rand, one rand ninety left. Uh, from that is the money that then gets paid to the distributor, which um, uh, yeah, the distributor which then comes to the artist. Okay, and that's for the sound recording. Huh? We're not so. If you are the composer, there's the portion that iTunes would have paid to Capasso, and you as the composer would then get that, get it from that, get from that channel. You see what I'm saying? This is this is why it's, why it's so important. Why I feel why it's I'm so evangelical about understanding this from before because there are so many ways that you can get your money. Okay, I'm not going to touch on Samro and, and Sampra today, but that's exactly the same thing, is that you're, you're, something, something goes out on radio, 5FM or SABC or whoever it is, they are paying Samro for the right to play the song, and then Samro is going to pay you as the composer, and they are paying Sampra the right to play your sound recording and they are paying Sampra. So you as the owner of the sound recording and as the composer should be getting money from Sampra and from Samro if your money is broadcast in public on radio. And if your, mon if your track is sold, you as the owner of the sound recording will be getting money from Ingrooves, but as the composer and the publisher, you are also getting money from Capasso. So you, this is why you need to be so clear about exactly what roles are being, were being um, uh, facilitated by which people. Question at the back. So with your guys, if you have to distribute uh, my song, and there will be an a artist uh, channel which will have my name and topic, but if I don't have uh, 1,000 subscribers and 4,000 watch time, will I still get paid for the views? Okay, so you've got to think of YouTube, because it it's a music service and a video service. YouTube is God in the in services for me. <laughs> um, so, audio streams that name where it says topic that is essentially YouTube music. It's what we it's the music that we've distributed to YouTube on your behalf. Okay, then you have your own channel where you're uploading music to, and that's the channel where you need to have your one thousand subscribers and four thousand watch hours. Okay in order to monetize your channel, okay? Now, YouTube is broken up into assets. So you get a video asset, an audio asset, and an audio video asset, okay? So the audio asset is what we distribute to YouTube, and then we use Content ID to claim audio assets on people who upload your music to YouTube on their own videos. So let's say someone has a, pic, a video of them driving in the countryside and they've got your song playing, we'll claim that and generate revenue off of it as an audio stream, okay? Now, you've got your own channel. This is where official artist channels come in and they're so valuable. We'll help you get your artist channel verified. You don't need to meet those uh, thresholds. Um, but now you start to, you start to upload videos with your music on it on your official artist channel. Now we get to claim as an audio video. So it's both the video and the audio is linked to it. And that's even a higher percentage compared to just a normal audio stream, um, if that makes sense. And then, yeah, so the, the big thing is, I think 
it's almost done away with in terms of YouTube and copyright issues because we claim across everything, even if it's user-generated content using your stuff. So you make making money even when anyone else uploads. And, to, and YouTube can take it even further. Once you've got an, an official artist channel, you can start to sell your merch there. You can start to sell tickets to events. I mean, it's really a beautiful platform for any artist, you know, uh, especially artists who are up and coming. You can self-release just off YouTube, you know. Um, so, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Cool. I'm gonna, I want to just hop in there quickly just to make – just to um, – this is going to require a little bit more like sort of experience over the next uh, like you know in your life but you need to be very clear that youtube is not representing when you watch a video you are not even though you are hearing the song okay so if you are listen, let's say you are watching aspele langa okay you are not hearing the sound recording you are you are watching and hearing what is what is legally called the cinematographical work okay the cinematographical work is a completely separate copyright, okay, that requires a synchronization of the video with the, 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 with the sound recording, okay. This is really, really important because the, the Copyright Act says that the cinematographical work is the sequence of moving pictures that includes all of the audio within it, okay. So have you ever heard of sync deals or licensing deals? Okay, I mean, well, not licensing deals, sync deals, okay. The term synchronization is what applies when the person who is releasing the cinematographical work, the video, okay, gets the approval from the owner of the sound recording to synchronize that sound recording copyright, the master, with the video, okay. But what is very important is once that audio gets included in the video, it's not the sound recording anymore. It's just the cinematographical work. It's not the, so it's the cinematographical work where the owner has, has gotten the approval, the license, the synchronization license from the owner of the sound, of the sound recording and the owner of the musical work. The, 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 this has to carry the synchronization authority or approval for both the musical work and the sound recording. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, I know it's, I don't want to I don't want to complicate it too much because I've already given you quite a lot of information. But that is one of the distinctions, and that's one of the reasons the application of what of of what Wade was saying is that they've released it. They're releasing your audio, okay, to YouTube Music, okay, and that doesn't come with a four thousand hours watch time, whatever. You own that thing. You've released it to YouTube, and you've said to YouTube, "You go and find me the money." Right, and YouTube is going to go everywhere. If you happen to be the owner of the video and you haven't got your four thousand hours or whatever like that, and you release the video, because they've released it through content with a content ID and they've released it through YouTube Music, they're going to go get the money. They're going to get the money from the playback of it, regardless of whether you have got your four thousand hours. The money is going to come from the from the monetization of the sound recording, okay, not from the monetization of the video. The monetization of the sound recording is how they're going to get the money back to you, okay? But there is an additional layer of money or revenue that can be generated from advertising and all that stuff that is specifically related to video, okay, that you have to cross the threshold of 4,000 hours for. So your monetizing of your video is not related to your sound recording. Your monetizing of your video is related to the cinematographical work, okay? Does that clear it up? Does that kind of give a better understanding of the... Thing. These are things that I'm unlocking for myself, like month by month as well. So, so, so it's not like this is not obvious. This stuff is not obvious. It's very, very like, yeah. Okay. Afternoon, um, Bud Jennings. Um, I have a question which relates to independent artists looking to pitch their music for distribution by uh, ingrowth. Is there a more direct approach to that, or besides um, being scouted by your A&R team, or maybe via your website platforms? Uh, via the website platform is where, where we find a lot of artists. Info at electromode.co.za is where we still look. Um, I'm happy to give out my email address here, which is gareth at electromode.co.za. It tends to be a little quicker, as working through the submissions can sometimes take time. So if you want to send me music, 
send me send me any music you already have online links to your spotify or apple profiles send me um handles to your social medias if you have songs that you're looking to release specifically that haven't been released send me as much info as you can you know and um and then we will get back to you and and tell you if this is something that we can work with right now if it's something that we feel has the potential to work with but the more info you can give on yourself the better a lot of people I think sometimes like I said earlier or it's quite daunting to share all of your handles etc the more info you can give the better how many submissions are you guys dealing with on a weekly basis sure <laughs> really yeah. 15 to 13 a day it's a lot and with in groups um, now you know Africa has become a territory I spend a lot of my focus is on other African countries it's now I'm getting the info at ingrooves.com, Africa, um, as well. But it's it's great stuff. There's a lot of great artists that we've come that have come through the ranks through there. So submit, submit. You guys have got a, 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 a inside lane here. You can mail me directly. It will it will make the process quick. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, Gareth at electromode.co.za. Hey, hi guys. My name is Tim. Uh, I'd like to ask, uh, do you think language is an advantage when, when doing music? Because when I look at these Nigerian artists, mostly they do their songs in English and you find they are good songs here, yeah, but they are done in maybe vernacular languages. Does that affect maybe the market or anything in terms of reaching more, more audiences? Uh, I so I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you, I'm gonna let you go on the marketing side. I'm just gonna I'm gonna give you a, a personal answer after this. Go. Uh, no, so this is also very personal. Um, I've actually spoken to a lot of people about that exact topic and why. Um, and it's funny you use Nigeria as an example. Um, I was spe I was speak actually speaking to an American, and he says in America there is a ton of Nigerians. And that's why the music translates overseas so well, you know? Um, and I think the vernac part of it, especially for us local artists who are, who are performing in, in their own vernac, um, it does, it, it rings home, but it's not easily translatable. And this is another reason why, I'm going back to YouTube and video, it's such a translatable medium to use because you might not understand it, but you can still understand what the video is telling you. And this is part of also the YouTube algorithm. If you then translate everything into English and put subtitles, the YouTube algorithm will say, okay, there's English subtitles, I can serve it in the UK. Or if you put German subtitles, they'll say, okay, I must serve this video in Germany. It's, it's incredible. So I think that's my own personal opinion around it. I mean. You know, that's, it's, it definitely makes a difference. I'm going to give you um, my response, which is that your, the, your decision on, on, I mean, not just your language, but your decision on every single piece of music that you ever do shouldn't be guided, should not be guided by, I mean, it's my opinion, so you can take with it what you take from it what you want. Uh, your, your decision making should be based on the feedback that you get from your tribe, not by the market that you want to hit or by the what's going on in the billboard top 100 or trying to copy somebody else or anything like that if you are an ama piano artist and you want to be an ama piano and your tribe is ama piano then you are going to go into that market but if you are going to just have a stab at ama piano because you want to be big because you want to just try to do what the biggest thing is out there if you want to sing in english because you think you're going to get the most sales in english all of that to me is ignoring, is, is, is very overtly ignoring your fan base or ignoring the, the potential feedback you could be getting from your tribe. Oliver Tukudzi didn't sing a word in English, if I remember correctly. I'm not sure if he ever sang a single word in English. And I would much rather spend my whole life, you know, trying to speak the truth of Oliver Tukudzi than, than I would, you know, trying to just be... In English, you know, singing in English because that's where I think the money is. You know what I mean? And well, I agree with you wholeheartedly as into why you write in certain languages and it feels 
correct, but I also don't think you should close yourself off to the idea of finding ways to have more people engage with your music. Sometimes it might not be necessarily singing in another language, it might be featuring somebody that sings in another language. Or like where it just, exp I didn't actually even know you could do that with the subtitles on YouTube, so I learned something today. Is, um, yeah, I agree with you 100%. I had breakfast with Bongo Ziwe Mabandla once. That's a great example. One of my favorite singers, and I, we were talking about the songs, and I, I explained how much one song meant to me, and he said, what do you think it means? And I said, well, this is exactly, I don't understand closer. And I said, this is how I felt. This is what I felt you were singing about. And he was like, you were 85% on the money. Music can, you don't always have to understand the language, but I do think try and find any ways you can to get more people to engage with your music. Which one was it? Gawe Mama. Form Lilo, those are my two favorites. Um, cool. Right, we've got another question. I've got, do you mind if I ask a question? Um, so, I'm an actor and I've just signed, I've signed with you, and here is the first banger, okay? Like, all it is at the moment is it's a banger that needs to go out there, it needs to be heard by the world, okay? What's going to happen now? Cool. Uh, and, and, how, and how long is it going to, like, what, what is the, what, like, from the time that I've given you the banger, as a wave file or an MP3 or whatever, like what's wave, it? always wave. wave. Okay, so you're gonna get a wave, and then you're gonna get, and you are going to now make magic with that track, okay? Without like giving us the whole playbook or the 300 page like breakdown, what are the kind of milestones you're gonna hit over the next year? So, I think first of all, you need to understand that um, that song is. You guys are still the label. You're still the driving force behind the song still, but we don't own anything. We're just distributing it for you and supporting your own efforts. So what we do with artists is they come to the office and we get the whole team around the table and we do a listening session, internal listening session. We now choose the focus single and we'll then start developing a content strategy and a rollout plan around this. You know, what is the song about? What where can we leverage it? Because TikTok is such a big thing, can we start a challenge? Can we get influencers involved to do their own content? Um, is there possibility for a music video? And we'll do that first rollout strategy. If it's just an EP or a single that you're releasing, we wanna, we wanna make sure it gets out, out the gate with a bang. So we will have everything in place so that when that song goes live, you want to boost the algorithm of Spotify so that it tells the, the curators, oh, the song's picking up quickly, we better put it into a playlist or something like that. Um, when it's a more established artist, um, like your Busters or your, your, your Black Diamonds, um, pitching is a lot easier. But a developing artist, it's, it's a lot harder. You've got to have that, that groundwork on social media. You know? And you need the artist to be working yeah, hard with you, right? Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Actually, change if, he, if the artist isn't pushing it, then wh why should we? If you're not believing in your own music, why should we? You know, and and that's it. The passion behind the artist and his music. Um, we've seen it many, many times. Somebody comes, they want a they want a distribution deal with us. They they are so passionate about their music. They're presenting their music to us. What what. But you look at their numbers and you look at their social media and their last time they post was January, February. You know, they're not engaging and doing anything with their music. They're not putting out. And this is a, it's actually a thing I'm, I'm, I'm looking at delving more into is, are artists still artists or are we just content creators like everyone else? You know, that, that line has blurred so much now. I mean, the people that are... Uh, I guess uh, I, I want to like kind of pose a challenge to that is that the that artists or songs that are speaking to our hearts, you know, are always are, are created by artists, right? And then there is also the noise of content creation that comes with that. 
And I suppose that, that maybe the challenge, and maybe this is the challenge that creators of face, is to is always to ensure that in the game of content creation that you are always you are always reducing yourself or at least checking yourself on whether you're you are still remaining an artist in the content creation game because the the the, the true power the true the true value of the copyrights that you create rest in their ability to talk to people abalele is a banger but the song, the lyrics, the reason why it's a banger, the reason why we have Abalele and Asibe Happy and those things is because there's something about the way that those lyrics speak to you that makes it more than just an Amapiano, just a more than just a club banger, you know. And there are there are lots of other songs out there that may form or fit into more of a content creation sort of thing where it's just like, you know, just getting like bang after I mean, you know, just club hits after after club hits are out after club hits, and yet you have the Msakis and you know the black you know the guys that are the, they are guys that that just remain because they will never stop they never stop speaking to us you know and I, I suppose it's the balance right hundred um, percent although there's there's a lot of songs that have come out and the content creation noise around it happened because of the initial content creation, you know? And that comes down to not every release is the same, you know? So you've got to really look at that. I think. Um, when it comes to whether up and, uh, upcoming artists or established artists, when we negotiate uh, around royalties, right? Um, is it advisable as an artist to be at the negotiating table um, and getting the royalties directly from the distributor, whatever the royalty split is? Or is it written in stone that um, the company, or the record label, will pay the royalties on your behalf? As well. So your your deal with your record label uh, is not going to ever change. If you are in a record label deal and your split is a split, you can't you won't be able to change that. That's not going to change at the negotiation table of the distributor. So if you you know you're because in a record label deal you will have assigned essentially the, the the very heart of a record label deal is says that for the period of three years or for the period of or for the duration that it takes me to release two albums I will assign all of the sound recording copyright to this other person okay and in that period the following percentages apply. Okay, so now your question is, in this, whatever's being created here is now coming to the distributor, and there's a deal you're asking about in the deal that this, in this deal, you're now saying, is it valuable for you to be at the table for that thing? Well, you won't get direct payment. So, so you're, artist, saying, you're saying if you're a featured artist on somebody's um, song, Yes, so, so you can, you can, you, you make the deal and you, you decide this guy gets 20% and this guy gets 30% and the label gets 50% or whatever. Your distributor can do, can do splits like that so that the payments go out like that. We need to see paperwork that everyone's agreed to do it that way and then it doesn't have to go to, directly to the label or to the main artist. It can just go out every month in those increments that it's been agreed upon now. Yeah. Cool. So just be clear that that, has, that that would be something that needs to be written in paper up front before that before the even the before the the, the thing is is, is recorded. Because um, just just to clarify that the the that distributors are not distributors are not concerned with dealing with artists and they're not concerned with dealing with composers. The, the actual function of a distributor is that they represent, that they take a product, a sound recording, that has been, and that, that the, 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 the right to distribute it has been assigned to them by the owner of the sound recording. So at the heart of that deal has got nothing to do with artists or composers or anything like that. So the fact that they may offer a service where they can direct money to the, to the artists is a value add on top of the 
crux of exactly what it is that they do. You know, so so it would be unwise to go with the assumption that, you know, I can just I will just go and sort out a side a side payment if you haven't got that thing locked down. And I mean, it's I would imagine it's like the kind of the kind of clause you're talking about is like for any deal, for any any deal or any monetization, this twenty percent will be paid directly from any like service provider directly to the artist. It's a very complicated clause to write into a contract. I, I can't imagine. I can't imagine you. You would need to make sure that that thing is so freaking locked, up, so locked down, because it's it's very, that would be very very difficult. Because the other problem is is that most of those, especially with sound recording, if let's say you're a featured artist and someone else's thing, it's most likely that the that the sound that the record label is going to put in some sort of recoupment cost into the deal. Okay, so if you go and like you happen to like you know make it as a featured artist to uh, to feature on a black coffee track or something like that they may they there may be an, like an existing clause in there that says that they have to recoup it they can't recoup the cost from you if you're getting direct payments from 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 all the sources of income you know what i mean so so that's why i'm saying in my mind i'm already just seeing all these all these complications around it on distro kit you can but again, in DistroKid, all the parties have to agree. Have to agree. You can't just you can't just go to DistroKid and just say, "Well, I get twenty percent of that track." It has to happen clearly with every single person, and changing those splits and all that stuff is very like, you know, yeah. You know, so, yeah. And um, just personally, if people, if you, it's your music, or you, you as a feature on a song, and people are negotiating on your behalf, I personally would suggest be there. I don't like people to talk about my work where I'm not in the room being part of this. So that would be my advice. You know, I don't think Bruce Springsteen, I don't think anything happens that he doesn't know about. You know what I mean? Like, my question has to do with performance royalties. So um, I make a song with a, with a dude and then this guy ends up performing the song in a different province or whatever. I know, I found out recently that Sam Rowe allows you to put down your performances. Um, I'd like to know how much they pay for that. And if this person is featured on my song and they're performing their verse wherever they are, am I, am I getting a certain percentage of that? Um, yeah, basically cool. that's the question, performance. Okay, so the first thing is, just to clarify, the word performance royalties is, uh, it's a misnomer, it's a, it's, a, it's a confusing word, okay? Because it doesn't relate to performers. Performance real royalties relate to the public performance of your composition. Okay. I just want to be clear about that. Okay. Performance royalty that if you are the songwriter, the lyricist, the composer, or the publisher of a song, and the work that you have created, the musical and literary work that you created, if that is performed in public in any way, a performance royalty is due to you. Okay, and when we say performed in public, we mean that if I had to get up now and sing Loliwe, if I had to take Loliwe and play it on radio, if I had to, if Loliwe was used in a television performance, in a television film on a series or something like that, all of those are what we call public performances, and for all of those, performance royalties are due. Okay, so in the same way that I was talking about how Capasso was set up, the law says... That provided that the song has been made public, okay, exactly the same way as recording it, provided that the song has been made public before, I don't need to ask permission to, to perform this music in public. I don't need to get the permission to put it on radio or something. I do need to get it permission to synchronize it, but, I don't, but once I've got the synchronization license, I don't have to get uh, uh, permission to play it in public, okay, provided that I pay a royalty to that owner. Okay. Now it's too it's not practical for every for me every time I want to go and if I want to get up and sing Loliwe, I've got to go to TS Records every single time and pay them like thirty cents or three rand every, you know for every time I perform it. And they've got to deal with like three hundred thousand people each coming to get, pay them three rand. Okay. So the law then says we have provided for organizations to be set up who will receive all the royalties and then distribute those royalties to the composers. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so in this case, the question is, somebody else is performing his song 
in Limpopo and we don't and and how, what's going to happen shouldn't he be getting money okay the answer is yes you should your question about how much money is due is very very tricky to say in fact i'm not even sure samra knows how much how much how, how much is due because a lot of it comes down to just they will collect licenses they aggregate all the information and then they, they make a kind of an estimated guess they actually use like um, they use calculations to estimate the overall play of your song based on the reporting because there isn't enough accurate reporting on the performance on live performances. Okay, in fact, even on radio, to, to be honest, it's a, it's a mess. But um, but regardless, there is money that's supposed to be sitting there. Okay, it will only come to you in the event that the venue or the place that was responsible for the performing of that song has let Samro know that your song was being performed, okay? It's not actually that art, the person who you're talking about, the other artist or the person who featured on your song, it's actually not his responsibility to, to cue the song. It's the responsibility of the venue to, to make sure that the, cue was, that the cue sheets are submitted. So it's actually the responsibility of the venue. Every single time a club, um, if Zone 6 is playing tracks every single night, like it's actually the responsibility of Zone Six to have cue sheets for every single night to say these are all the songs that we played. Okay, that's not practical. It doesn't. It doesn't happen in uh, in in um, overseas. They have monitoring. You you have monitoring systems that are put in that actually do all the queuing, all the queuing, and you know of of that stuff, and then they submit. But um, anyway, so the the answer to your question is the is that you should be getting royalties. Nobody really knows how much it is. It's probably not a lot if it's live performances. Live performances pay a lot less, I think, than uh, than radio. If I'm if I'm if I'm not mistaken. On top of that, it would require that a you have notified Samro exactly perfectly, okay, and following that, that the venue has notified Samro that that song, which matches word for word, letter for letter, your notification and the splits that you and the other artist have also notified are exactly letter for letter perfect exactly you know done once all that's done samro may pay you for it okay it's tricky i i mean i don't really know how, what else to say I, like it's that's the reality okay well, so you just follow what up? You, I'm, I'm sorry i'm sorry so what you're saying is samro has to agree um no the the place where i was performing has to agree that i was performing there so i'm sending out um information to samro that I performed on this particular day, and that venue also has to do the same thing. But no, not the venue. Oh, you're right. So you can actually you now on the portal. I mean, yeah. I, like again, I'm not this. Um, I just I I'm just don't want to like uh, it's nervous. Like it's, this is a very very the portal is a very very tricky environment. So yes, there's a there is a there is a part in the portal where you can claim that your your song was played at this venue, you know, and you can go and you can. And, I'm not sure what 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 that actually results in. You know what I mean? Um, I, I know from my I know I've I submit like literally second by second reporting of my songs on radio that is matched that is audited like that is that is audited, and I still get I still don't get paid by Samro. You know, so it's a, so yeah, it's just a, it's a very tricky situation. Yeah, go for it. What you call it? Is it is, is it like an additional? Um, function, um, or is it something that um, you guys also like work with them? Is do do, do we go to to Samra and then come to you guys? Um, is it that's just what cool. I want to know? I'm I'm gonna actually answer that because I'm gonna give it to you from an industry perspective and not from the from a company's perspective. You, when, as a rights, there, there are seven rights holders in the track, which we've, which we've discussed, and we've got the sound recording. Okay, we call, think of the sound recording, the, the, um, the technical term for the sound recording or that copyright is what we call an entrepreneurial work. Okay, the reason for why it's an entrepreneurial work, it is something that was made, it's very tangible, and it can be sold. Money can change hands for it. Okay, I make a table, okay, and I go and sell a table. I can make another table with the exact same design, okay? I can make a CD and make another CD with the same with the same track in it, or I can take an MP3 and I can copy it and make the exact same thing, and each of these things has a value that can go and get sold, right? Same as I sell a table, 
okay? And in this, in the world of what InGrooves does is they are, if I sell a table, if I make 100 tables and there is a furniture distributor who is able to get this table out to all of the right people who want to buy the tables that I make, okay, the InGrooves is that function. They are the people who specialize in knowing how to take the exact WAV or MP3 or the, the, the audio file that you have created. They are specialists in being able to take that file and putting it in the right people's, in front of the right people, in, on the right platform so that money is generated and that money then comes to you. Okay. And you, you want to be careful about, like, about talking about royalties from that because that is actually a percentage that is that's that's that is a percentage of sales okay i don't know how you what how you actually refer to it um but yeah so you're gonna so you so when you're talking about the sale of the audio you want to you want to think about it in your head as the sale of a product okay because royalties or or the passive income that comes from um, what you've created, let's say from mechanical royalties, which is, we haven't dealt with here. I'm not going. We're not going to talk about that if that's okay. That's we'll, we can maybe address that in another week. That's Sampra. Okay, is the final piece of all these puzzles of the of all these things. All of these other people get money or get money to you based on the release of the sound of the the release and the sales uh, of of the um, of this MP3 of this audio of this audio file. You want to sell. You want to sell it. You want you want money to change hands. If people are if people are listening on Spotify, money is changing hands by virtue of the fact that they are subscribing to that service. Okay. If you are people are watching or listening to your music on YouTube Music. Okay. If it's on YouTube. Okay. They are they are paying by by watching adverts. And if they are using YouTube Premium or YouTube Music, they are paying their subscription. People are buying songs on iTunes. Or buying albums, I don't know. Do they do that anymore? Not really. Well, yeah, okay. But so you can either buy or you're subscribing. But there's money changing hands the whole time for the valuable audio file that you have created. Okay, and that's the function that they that 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 that's, that Ingrus uh, provides. Everything else is essentially you would. It's better to think of those as royalties or think of those as passive income. That that as passive income that comes as the result of your creation, you know what I mean? But the selling is the hard work. The selling is the thing, I need to get the table into something else. Somebody has to pay money for it. That's where the hard work comes and that's where the, that's where the grind comes from. You know what I mean? Cool. And, and the reason we can't give one figure, how much we pay out per stream from Apple or from Spotify or YouTube is remember that somebody with a premium account you'll get paid more out than somebody that's listening on a free account. So you do get paid out for all of the streams. It's just different values and also different territories. So some territories pay out more than other territories. Afternoon, gents. Um, my name is Tonic. I just needed to ask a question based on, so you receive the song from the artist or from the band, whoever, um, and then you guys do the marketing and distribution. Before the marketing and distribution, do you sit down with the artists and have certain targets based on possible fo following, social media following, in terms of what targets you want to reach in terms of marketing or in terms of a revenue um, after the release? And if you do not meet those targets, what is the action plan afterwards? I don't, I, I, I've never been involved in a situation where there are targets, and if you don't hit those targets, we won't release. We won't release another song. You know, um, I think if there's been been money spent and money has to be recouped, or it, 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 we would would maybe be wary of putting the same kind of spend on another song before recouping there. But it wouldn't mean that you couldn't release another song. Does so, that make sense? Um, I'm going to ask a question on behalf of everybody. What kind of um like, what's the range of deals that, uh, so on a, um, I think, you know, let's say on the one spectrum, do you do single, single releases or do you do, uh, do you work on like sort of uh, periods or terms, uh, years? What? We, 
on occasion we'll do single releases or one album releases. We prefer to work on terms. So our 80-20 straight distribution deal is on a two-year term, is to have a relationship, work together. Um, that's 80 for the artist, yeah. Thanks. And then we have other standards, which is a 70-30. There's different ones, 60-40s, 50-50. It all depends on, on what is needed from us to make that happen. Um, we've even got to a point now where we have hybrid deals. So I don't know if you know the, uh, the band BTS. Yeah, so BTS is within Grooves, and they've got a deal that in Grooves distributes their music, but it's Interscope. Really? Interscope, as a label, they've signed on, so they haven't signed to Interscope, but Interscope gets a percentage of their streams and market it. So it's kind of, it, it's, it's a deal going forward that I think is going to change the way distribution's happening, and it's going to be a really great relationship between distributors and major and major labels where artists still still own their masters. You're signing on for a term, a, a period, and yeah. So that's that, that's probably the newest deal that we've can offer. One more question: What about the artists that are all in? Are there? Is it a family? Like, do the artists like the you know you've got like let's say an artist gets in like what's the what's the likelihood of of like sort of internal collaborations being set up and stuff because it's just easier it's is it is it not easier for artists to collaborate that are both with that are both already involved with you guys uh yeah it, we it, it's, it's much easier when artists are with us so even you know in groups has almost 30 offices all around the world and wade has already started dealing with many uh, um, sort of account <laughs> i just forgot my own title <laughs> yeah, integration. So if you've got it, if you've got, if we've got an artist that wants to work, say we've got a country singer who wants to work with Dolly Parton, who's within Grooves, is we, it, it is a lot easier for us to talk to her account manager and go, listen, we're part of this in Grooves, it makes that process easier. We, we locally, we, we help facilitate a lot of features, a lot of collabs. Um, what we can do is, introduce you to each other. First of all, send the music. Do they like the music? Take it another step. Introduce the two artists to each other. We can't force anyone to work with anybody else, but we can try to facilitate where we do, like where we can. I want to know if, uh, we, would you consider working with the artist that doesn't have any social media presence at all? Yes, I think Wade should answer this, but I've been in the situation and I can't see how... But they have good music, though. Have good music. I think Wade would be better to talk about this, yeah. Um, we have special cases where we have, but very far and few between. Um, we are an invite-only sort of service, so um, every artist and every deal gets vetted um, on their merits and demerits and what the potential could be, you know, all that sort of thing. Um, and for artists that are in that situation, um, I tell them, you know what, go to your, your DIY services, get your music out there, start marketing, start promoting, and once it's picking up and it's moving, come back to us again and try again. Okay. I, I, for me, it's just I can't understand why an artist wouldn't want to go that route. The beautiful thing about social media is I think when I was young and into music, I used to get like the hit parade and top 40 and then you just find out what your favorite artists are up to, what they're releasing and then right at the back of the magazine, there'd sometimes be fun stuff like them on the beach or walking a dog. Now social media has basically put you, put your favorite artist in your home. Um, how many people follow the pay record labels Instagram handles they follow the artist so for me it just it seems irrelevant these days to not it, it, you talk directly to your audience that's how they communicate with you so just to wrap just to wrap that one up the the next thing is that it was interesting for me that you said that um, would you would you sign an artist that has that doesn't have a following but has good music and the truth is that there's nobody that can determine whether it's good music yet because there has been no feedback. 
the only feedback has been from you about yourself or your very close family about yourself. And this is again the it's the humility or the, the it's the reality and the honesty of putting yourself out there that is so important as being part of that musical journey. You know, because if you're making music for your family, then you get to say, I make good music. Because your feedback, because 100% of your tribe has given you the feedback that you need, you know. But if, you're, but if the idea is that you want your music to speak to a lot of people, then you have to give your music the opportunity to get the feedback from the people outside of your, you know, outside of the wall that, or, you know, the, 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 you know, the safe, the safe haven of where your music sounds good, you know, because music does sound, music, like, you get to love every single second of every single piece of music that you've done, you know, you get to invest in the time to listen to it and all that stuff, but, like, in exactly the same way that you only listen to stuff, you will only give, like, a specific amount of your time to other people's music, you know, is exactly the same kind of respect you need to give to the fan base, to the fans out there, you know, to say, I need your feedback, therefore, tell me what you think of this, you know. Sure. Uh, actually, uh, are your agreements exclusive agreements, or do you, do you allow, maybe if I'm in using Amuse, maybe as, an, as a distributor, can I use Amuse and still use in grooves, or is it exclusive? Agreements on it. There are there are, are non-exclusive agreements. <coughs> we try not do them um, as as far as possible. Um, if we're going to be putting all our weight behind an artist, we want to to know that we we're in this for for a little bit of a longer time than just one album. There are special cases, special releases, which might just be a one-off. Release, in which case it, it it would be something like that. Okay. Um, before ask, before he comes, and I want to just I'd like to also just give an outsider an outsider view on that as well. Is you don't want to be in an, in this kind of a, in this kind of agreement. You don't want to be in it where it's not where it's not exclusive. If you are not a hundred percent in it, you should you cannot expect them to be a hundred percent in it. Does that make sense? You know what I mean? Like you're coming into this. You're coming if 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 you don't believe that they should be there, that, or if that they deserve 100%, you may as well just do district hit. You may as well just do tune core, and then you go and get it. You, get, you go and get it yourself because you're not going to get back from them what you what you want. In I, I would imagine the non-exclusive deals are are almost certainly always coming from a position where they may actually be very very low in the power balance, and it may be that they are the ones that need to actually prove themselves. In an example like where you know a big international artist is giving them an opportunity to show what they can do, you know, but not going to give up their not going to give up you know whatever exclusivity just yet, you know. And if you're not in that position, am I right? I mean, I can't imagine I can't imagine in an environment where I mean I wouldn't I wouldn't want to be in an environment where it's not where it's where this kind of thing is where, where this kind of thing is not exclusive because a big part of the beauty and a big part of the journey of this thing is developing the relationship. You know, and especially in a world where you are not giving up copyright, you get this is like, you know, I mean, I'm I'm kind of waxing lyrical here, but the it's it's a very very important opportunity that shouldn't be missed when you engage in this kind of relationship. But if you had to decide to go into this distribution relationship, that you want this thing to be where you are like, where you're picking up the phone every single day. What can I do next? What do I need to do? Is this the right thing? Did I make the right decision here? Like, if we're going to release in two weeks, what can, like, am I giving too many posts, too little posts, da, da, da. You, want, you want that to be, like, a true partnership, you know? The next, there was somebody, yeah, go for it. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Mainsi. Um I have a question for money. Oh, the Ingrove uh, company. As much as Ingrove is a distribution company, right? Uh, does it offer like um, management team, anything like that? As so management, as in your live work, you're basically no, not as in grooves. We don't manage artists. We from like management or agency. Um, we used to have a sister company that that looked after that sort of stuff, and hoping to have one again, but we don't do it ourselves. Uh, second question, um, 
uh, does Ingrove okay uh, differs with the services when it comes to like maybe it's a record company and then there's an artist maybe I'm an in independent artist and I own a record label right and then there's a bigger one there's a bigger company like uh, let's say Mabala Noise or something let me make an example right does the services uh, differs as in like a small uh, independent company uh, like uh, with the Mabala noise, that does is there a difference with the services? I think the best way to put it, there's no difference between the services. The only difference would be one might have the might have the value and the amount of streams they're bringing in that means that we could advance those services, where the other one would have to pay upfront for those services. But the services are exactly the same. Okay, and available to all. Thank you. Guys, I think we're going to wrap up. Um, it's, almost time, uh, it's almost time now. Um, so um, I actually just want to say from my side, it was, this was really, really enlightening for me. Um, and I hope it was for you guys as well. So the, this, this, this part of it is, uh, I think, for, for creators and people that are, that are, you know, the people that just want to write good songs or people that just want to release good stuff, you know, it's like it can be quite... Um, daunting to kind of figure out exactly you know who do i trust and who do i you know um uh you know who do i give away things to you know um and uh yeah i got a i got a, a really a kind of good sense of what a you know what a distributor does and the value it is and also what i should be looking out for in you know as if i was an aspiring artist cool